This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 364, Using History Lessons to Create Wealth, by Chris Reining of chrisreining.com, and I am Dan, the guy who is here each Monday through Friday, reading to you from some of the best blogs on personal finance. And this episode is brought to you by SendPro from Pitney Bowes. SendPro has three times the features of stamps.com at one third the price. Visit pb.com slash finance to learn more and try it free for 90 days. After that, you'll get SendPro for only $5 per month. That's a third of the cost of stamps.com. That special $5 rate is good for the lifetime of your SendPro subscription, but only when you sign up at pb.com slash finance. Now let's get to it and hear today's post as we optimize your life. Using History Lessons to Create Wealth by Chris Reining of chrisreining.com. Quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santayana from Reason in Common Sense. A classic example of the aforementioned quote is Hitler's invasion of Russia. Napoleon had done it once and Hitler made the same mistake, suffering the same fate. On both occasions, the Russians simply retreated, drawing the enemy further and further into Russia in their advance. And then, when the Russian winter struck and the invaders found themselves unprepared and ill-equipped to deal with it, they were killed by the thousands during their retreat. I used to hate history. I always thought, why should I study and care about all these things that happened a long time ago? I'm only going to care about what's happening now and in the future. That's what's important. I was naive because there's so much that has happened before that we can learn from. I like to use this information to quell my fears about my stock portfolio and to drive portfolio management decisions. But first, Let's have a brief recap of two of my favorite financial events that back up Santayana's claim. The Tulip Mania. Often considered the first speculative bubble, Tulip Mania reached its peak when prices for tulip bulbs in the Netherlands skyrocketed to a point where a single bulb sold for 10 times the yearly salary of a skilled craftsman. The tulip made its first appearance in Europe in 1554 and was unlike any other flower in Europe at the time. The wealthy built their gardens around the tulip, and as a result, it became a status symbol. As the popularity of the tulip grew, growers began paying more and more for the bulbs, and the prices followed suit. In one month alone, tulip prices increased 20-fold. Eventually, the Dutch created a sort of futures market, where the rights to buy bulbs at the end of the season could be bought and sold. It reached a peak when traders who were buying bulbs hoping to sell them at an inflated price could no longer find buyers at the higher prices. Bulb contract prices collapsed, and the whole market came to a screeching halt. The dot-com bubble. The internet, first offered commercially in the late 1980s, began rapidly expanding across the world in the early 1990s. During that time, it's been estimated traffic on the internet was growing by 100% per year. The rise in usage sent investors into a tizzy over this new economy, and venture capitalists began freely issuing startup capital seemingly to any company with an E prefix or com suffix. The stock prices of these dot-com companies soared, and traditional valuation methods used by investors, such as the P-E ratio, were thrown out the window. But by the year 2000, many of these dot-com startups were close to burning up all their cash without ever turning a profit. By 2001, some companies, like my favorite example, Pets.com, failed completely. Others lost a large portion of their market capitalization but still exist today, like Cisco and Amazon. Of course, there are many other bubbles and crashes like the Florida real estate craze in 1926 and the recent housing bubble of 2007. Santayana's right. What happened in all these situations? The price of the object increased. There was more demand for the object by new buyers, thereby increasing the price, increasing demand by new buyers, increasing the price. This cycle goes on while the market for the object builds more and more momentum. There are generally two frames of thinking during these bubbles. The first is, it's different this time. For instance, while we watch housing prices skyrocket, a euphoria sets in, and some people believe that prices will continue to skyrocket indefinitely. We all know the stories of a woman on a housekeeping salary buying a $400,000 house or flipping millions of dollars in real estate. We think we're in a new world of infinitely increasing returns. The second frame of thinking is, I'll get out at the top. This is the investor who realizes that there's a bubble, but they also believe they will ride the speculation to the absolute top and get out there with the largest possible return. As we know, there is no way to time a market. It's a fool's errand. If someone at a cocktail party sidles up to you and tells you they can, ask them why they're still working in nine to five. These bubbles will happen. I feel the same euphoria right now with 3D printing. While it may be the next greatest thing, the next industrial revolution, 
I've been hesitant to invest in any 3D printing company. Tulips, the internet in the late 1990s, real estate in the early 2000s, these bubbles all played out the same. What we need to remember is that we need to be out as soon as things start to get speculative. Where we are today. In 1981, when Mr. Everyday Dollar was two, the US was in a deep recession with 11% unemployment and with 30-year mortgage rates at 18.5%. Budget deficits were high and the national debt skyrocketed. Investing in stocks was shunned, but it turned out it was a great time to invest in them. We just had a recent housing bubble, deep recession, and unemployment at 10%. I remember very few investors keeping their money in common stocks in 2007 to 2009, but it turned out to be a great time to buy. Some of my best ever investment returns were because I stayed invested during the downturn and was regularly putting new money into common stocks. We were told it's different this time but it turns out that the 1981 playbook proved to be successful in 2007. The market has since roared back and is poised to reach new highs as evident by the Dow and S&P indexes. So what's the current playbook? Perhaps 1952. The US economy had high unemployment, massive government debt, huge stimulus plans, and long-term interest rates were capped. With all those seemingly overwhelming problems, the Dow rose from 256 to 995 by 1966, almost a fourfold increase. The investors who ignored the fiscal problems were well rewarded by investing in common stocks, while those who pulled their money out and sat on the sidelines lost the potential of creating great wealth. You just listened to the post titled Using History Lessons to Create Wealth by Chris Reining of chrisreining.com. And this episode was brought to you by SendPro from Pitney Bowes. SendPro has three times the features of stamps.com at one third the price. SendPro gives you the tools you need to save money and time with postage. Literally, they actually give you a 10 pound scale for free when you sign up for a free 90 day trial. You'll have everything you need and there's no software installation. It works right from the web. You can compare shipping rates and delivery times between the USPS and other major carriers to ensure you always get the best deal when you ship packages and even print paid shipping labels, not only for the USPS, but other carriers too. And of course, you can track your shipments from the same easy-to-use interface. Try it out. You can get an amazing deal only through pb.com slash finance. You'll get SendPro free for 90 days, and when your free trial is over, you'll get SendPro for only $5 a month, which is a rate that's good for the lifetime of your SendPro subscription. That's $5 a month compared to $15.99 a month for Stamps.com, which is three times the features of Stamps.com at one-third the price. Again, you can get all of that through our special link, pb.com slash finance. And that's gonna do it for today's show. Tomorrow, I'll be back with a post from PT Money. So I'll see you there in the Friday show, where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this podcast, but also Optimal Living Daily, the show where I read to you from even more blogs covering finance, productivity, minimalism, personal development, and more from incredible bloggers like Derek Sivers, Zen Habits, Mark and Angel, The Minimalists, and all the ones you hear on this show too. So if you enjoyed today's episode and like taking amazing blogs on the go, come on over to Optimal Living Daily and subscribe to that one too. And together, we'll start optimizing your life. You've been listening to Optimal Finance Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us. And remember, your optimal life awaits.